Sure, in collaboration with the U.S. Cochrane uh, branch. And today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Denise Thompson from the University of Alberta, who will be talking to us about the newly formed Cochrane Climate Hello. Health Working Group. Hello, welcome. <laughs> and uh, I have to thank uh, Patricia. Hey, I'm Bob Delavalle, the director of the University of Colorado Cochrane so, Affiliate. But I just, so we, we had on site, we had an on site IP address. So I just, but our easy proxy is working great for all our vendors. Okay, I think we just had a little interruption from somebody who realized that they were not on mute, uh, a common Zoom occurrence. Yes. Uh, and I have to thank Patricia Hain for suggesting Denise as our speaker today. Uh, Patricia is our co, um, our director, co-director here in Colorado. And Patricia, if you'd like to give the uh, formal introduction to Denise, I'll pass the talking baton over to you. And thank you, Denise, for joining us. Yes, uh, I'm very honored to introduce Denise and to be also a member of the group that she forms, which has been a very prolific, productive group. Uh, Denise has been moving and uh, shaking the science of climate health. Um, I'm looking forward for her dissertation and future publications. She chose such a dignifying area to perform her doctoral studies. And um, it's such a honor for me to be a, a member of her group, of her leadership. And uh, I really wanna welcome her to Colorado, which is uh, such a friendly state in terms of climate health and now to United States that we are very interested in supporting our new administration initiatives. So without further ado, Denise, I would like to open the session for you, and then you can tell us more about all the great work you are doing. Thank you. Hey, great. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Bob and Patricia and everyone for coming. So I'll just um, share my screen here, which always just takes a moment. Um, so just um, um, because it's the Zoom era and everyone's working from home, I'll just start by mentioning I have uh, two dogs who love nothing better than to bark uproariously during my Zoom calls. So my daughter is on dog duty for the coming hour, but in the event that they do interrupt, I, I apologize in advance. So um, the topic of uh, today's session is the is an update from the Cochrane Climate Health Working Group, um, which I'm involved in um, in my capacity as a PhD student at the University of Alberta. Um, so there's there's two things on this screen, and um, I've I've tried in making my slides to make them um, kind of really legible on, on a variety of screen sizes. Um, hopefully I've, I've mostly succeeded. Um, so I have my overview on, on the left hand side and then the tweet that went out about this um, just to kind of uh, illustrate the, the so the tweet is talking about how um, that saying I will present on how evidence synthesis informs the discussion about the impact of climate on health and health systems. And that's actually uh, an absolutely enormous topic that, um, uh, I mean, people, there's armies of people devoting their whole, uh, their whole academic careers to that. So what I'll try and do is kind of take that as my, my overarching thing for talking a bit about Cochrane and why it needs a, a, Co a climate health working group. Um, so I'm going to spend some time talking about the uh, the overall health impacts of climate change. Um, some of you may know a lot about this, some of you may be less familiar, um, but I'll spend a little bit of time on that and then I'll move to talking about um, the Climate Health Working Group. Um, and in the last 48 hours or so I've been adding and subtracting and changing slides, so I'm no longer 100% sure how long this presentation takes, but my hope is that um, unless I really get carried away talking, there will be time at the end for questions. Um, so just to quickly tell you what I'm going to tell you, um, to give you a bit of the framework, because I always find it helpful when, when people do this. 
Um, so climate change uh, is associated with a wide range of impacts on human health, of course, animal health as well, the whole, all sorts of health, health and health systems. And these are mediated by social, economic and physical factors. Um, and so which makes the study of, of climate change and health really fascinating and complex. Um, I'm going to argue that research is needed on appropriate evidence synthesis methods for this literature. Um, and, um, and that's actually where I've been moving my, my doctoral studies to. Uh, and then I'll tell you a bit about um, the many people within Cochrane who are eager to use their skills, um, particularly in evidence synthesis, to respond to the climate health crisis. So who am I? Um, I'm, uh, I've I'm a PhD student, but I'm, I've started graduate studies in, in midlife. I have about 20 years of experience in health promotion and health research. Um, I've been part of Cochrane since 2004. Um, that's a list there of some of the roles I've held. So um, I have a deep affection for Cochrane and the people in it. I think it's a, a fantastic organization and, and I'm proud to, to be part of it. Um, in, uh, and, uh, and I love the, the community and the people I've met. Um, in 2019, I think, I started a PhD program, a part-time PhD program in the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta. Um, and uh, I'm going to be studying, working on my proposal right now, going to be carving out a topic around evidence and evidence synthesis methods for climate health impacts. Um, and, um, and actually my work with the Cochrane Climate Health Working Group has been um, really helpful for me in guiding my own thinking. So I'm going to assume that since you've showed up today, you're, um, you um, accept that, that climate change is, is, um, is, a, is something that's happening. Um, I know not everyone does, but um, just to really sum up climate change really quickly. This is a great slide. It's real. It's us. Um, experts agree. It's bad. And yet there is hope. Um, and, I, and I think that's a really important message. You, you, you can see a lot of, it's, it's difficult to balance the seriousness of climate change and yet the fact that much can still be done about it. So actions related to climate change fall into um, three very, very, very broad categories. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend any time on these beyond this slide. Um, like I said, this it's just such a, a huge topic. Um, I'll, I can only give a really um, high level view, but there's on the right hand side, you see mitigation, which is crucial. That's reducing the source of greenhouse gas emissions. That, that action is totally crucial for reducing our trajectory of warming and other changes. Adaptation on the left-hand side, also very important around um, building ongoing uh, programs and infrastructure and so on to, um, to react to uh, climate-related changes that are, are baked in. Um, and then undergirding all of that is uh, monitoring um, uh, the data gathering around emissions and environmental changes. So how does climate change affect health? Um, so climate change is predominantly experienced in uh, changing weather patterns. And so, and those changing weather patterns are um, responsible for shifting the geographic range, the seasonality and intensity of transmission um, of certain climate sensitive infectious diseases. It, um, extreme weather, which we're seeing more of because of climate change, um, is also leading to increase in morbidity and mortality that's associated with events such as flooding, hurricanes, uh, droughts, heat waves, etc. Um, the evidence base on the size, the timing, and the distribution of the burden of disease and injury related to climate change is continuing to merge over time as climate change unfolds. Um, and crucially, none of the health impacts of climate change are new. Um, so, there, when I, so earlier I talked about the, 
the extension, for example, of the geographic range of climate sensitive infectious diseases. Those infectious diseases are not in, the, in of themselves new. Um, the, um, it's, um, but it's, it's learning how to, to manage them perhaps in new places. And I've highlighted in green this last sentence, the challenge in, is ensuring that climate change is explicitly and appropriately considered in policy and programs. Because for me, that is, that is so much at the heart of my interests and um, passions. And I, and I think too in, in a lot of what, in what has led a lot of the people who have joined the Climate Health Working Group. Um, um, that this, that point is, is part of where we can make a contribution. So climate change and health systems, another huge topic that I'm going to do disservice to by skating through in, in two slides. Um, it's worth noting, it's a bit of a tangent, that health systems are, are in and of themselves major contributors to carbon emissions. Um, and so many health systems around the world, including many in the US, um, are working on reducing um, those emissions, which is fantastic. Um, I wanted to find a US example of um, the impact of certain climate sensitive weather events on health systems. So I picked this um, note among the, the many, many devastations associated with Hurricane Maria. Um, one, one impact was disruption of the supply chain for health systems in the US um, because of um, uh, the, the loss of uh, an ongoing supply of, of IV bags. So uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, has identified these 10 dimensions of um, what it takes to build a climate resilient health system. Um, I'm not going to spend time going through these, but even if you just scan them, the reason I, I put the slide in was so that you could scan the list and get a sense of the breadth to which um, health systems have to be thinking about climate change. You're, as you can see, it, it shows up everywhere from um, the, tr the you know training and support of your health workforce um, through to uh, emergency preparedness and management programs and, and much else besides. Um, so to uh, this is a slide developed by uh, your uh, CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, so in the center, you can see the, the four phenomena of rising sea levels, more extreme weather, rising temperatures, the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, and then radiating out from that some of the health impacts that we see, or some of the climate change impacts that we see, and then broadening out again to um, uh, human health impacts. Um, and I love presenting this slide because I find people really, um, it, it's really helpful for people um, that, that, that the way it, it broadens out like that really helps people wrap their heads around the, um, the, the breadth of, of health impacts from climate change. So because I'm presenting to a Cochrane crowd, and um, I thought I would uh, spend a couple of minutes on uh, confidence ratings for the evidence. Um, so um, I'm going to spend, um, I think, the next four slides going through this, um, the, these tables. Uh, and again, if you're on a small screen, you won't be able to, to read these in detail, but that's okay. Um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show is just um, a couple of things. So first on the right hand side, or sorry, left hand side, we're seeing um, here um, the category of direct effects of, of climate change on health. Um, so talking about things like increased number of warm days and nights, where you can make a really clear link between climate change um, and the certain weather phenomenon. So here, over here on the right now, the health impacts are here, and there's a very high confidence rating based on available evidence about that. Um, below, however, um, that we see um, the health impacts of a decreased number of cold days and nights. So I'm talking to you from Western Canada, where um, today it's uh, minus 18 Celsius. 
So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about cold weather where I live. Um, and certainly with a decreased number of cold days and nights, it seems very plausible um, that there will be uh, some improvement. For example, if, if people are precariously housed, street people, um, they um, obviously it's a lot easier for them if there's, there's less cold weather. However, overall, um, sorry, where did my arrow go? Oh, it's back. Overall, the confidence rating here is low. Um, and that's, that's just partly due, I think, to um, a lack of study, um, but it highlights that what seems intuitively um, straightforward doesn't actually have a strong evidence base yet. So here um, on the left-hand side, there's a category of effects mediated through natural systems. So a little less direct uh, relationship between climate change over here and health over there. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading them, but here um, we see very high confidence around increased risks of food and waterborne diseases, but only medium confidence around what that's going to mean for vector-borne diseases, such as um, uh, vectors meaning mosquitoes and ticks and whatnot. Then a little less direct, uh, we have uh, effects heavily mediated by human systems. So here is things like how higher temperatures and changes in precipitation that we also saw in the, the direct impacts. Um, what is that going to mean for um, nutrition, for example? Um, and here you see the food health risks being, so lower food production, lower access to food during, due to reduced supply and higher prices. Um, and that, that's what they mean by effects mediated by human systems, is that the effects of climate change as such also get diffused through social, economic, physical um, factors around um, class, race, um, poverty of the country you're in, and so on. And that those factors that are not climate change factors heavily mediate how the climate change um, over here and the health impacts over there. Hopefully that made sense. Um, overall, um, we have a high confidence rating um, that there will be negative health impacts of climate change and those will outweigh um, any positive effects. Okay, so going back to this nifty um, CDC slide, um, just to, to sort of drive home that point a little bit around the fact that impacts can be both proximal or distal or in between a range that's a range not a dichotomy and that they're always mediated by social economic and physical factors and so i put a green circle around just these two um so where you've got up here you've got heat related illness and death which i've as i've already highlighted we've got a high degree of confidence and consider that a direct relationship but down here where we're talking about forced migration, civil conflict, um, there's clearly a much longer chain between, um, say, a drought or a heat spell associated with climate change and those impacts. And those impacts will be mediated a lot through where you live, how poor you are, what gender you are, with, you know, your old, many other vulnerability factors. Okay. So this blank slide is a chance for me to draw breath um, and then change direction a little bit. So what about evidence synthesis? Um, so I love this sentence, which was published just a few months ago um, by, in the journal of Cochrane's uh, sister organization, the Campbell Collaboration. Um, and this is, they have just instituted a group within the Campbell Collaboration um, around uh, developing evidence syntheses on climate solutions. And so this editorial is, is part of the, the launch of that group. And there's, these are really important points they're making here. There is no time left for trial and error. Um, so you know, climate change is also already well underway. Uh, we know that um, even if we were to cease greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, there are uh, numerous negative impacts that are already baked in just from the warming that's happened to date. 
Um, so we need to move quickly to prevent acceleration of further change. Um, their next point is resources for organizing a transformation into a carbon neutral world are inherently limited. And I, I'm sure I don't have to explain about limited resources to, to people working in healthcare. So there, what they conclude is decision making on climate solutions needs to be based on the best available evidence. So what does that mean? Um, there's, there's also been some uh, challenges um, published recently around challenging the field of health, health, health evidence synthesis to get faster in developing adequate methods for evidence syntheses related to climate change. Um, and I'm just going to list a few of them in the next few slides. Um, so this first point here challenges um, the intervention focused systematic review logic that's often deployed in health related evidence syntheses and points out that um, the problem, wicked policy problems in uh, related to health of natural and human systems raise broad questions that are really difficult to push into that that narrow logic. Um, we also need to learn a lot more about how to integrate multiple lines of evidence from different disciplines um, to serve the purpose of um, serving decision makers with actionable and policy relevant information. Um, so climate change is so broad, um, it's, not, it's not a single phenomenon. Um, and climate impacts are, although they're not, you know, their their weather, their geography, their um, that they're not they're not health in and of themselves. So, and yet, evidence from those areas needs to be off to do truly relevant health syntheses. We need to learn how to pull from those other disciplines. Um, and systematic review research. It, this builds a bit on my previous point. Um, there's a there's a challenge there in knowing how to respond to the vast scope and heterogeneity of climate literature um, and in particular the fact that um, the uh, responses to climate change or um, knowledge of the impacts of climate change are so much bound up in the central role of contextual and mediating factors such as the ones i've i've already spoken a little bit about also, um, health-related uh, health knowledge synthesis methods have developed looking at stuff that happened in the past. So when we gave drug X versus drug Y or drug X versus drug Y versus drug Z um, to people and, and did the systematic review of that or the meta-analysis, um, that all, that's all done. It all happened in the past. Whereas climate change, um, a lot of what decision makers want to know is what's going to happen in my space in a year, five years, 10 years, 30 years. Um, and we have deep uncertainty about those, uh, those outcomes. Is it possible to uh, incorporate or even acknowledge that, that deep uncertainty? Again, with the purpose of, of informing decision makers, since um, I would argue the, the majority of evidence syntheses such as systematic reviews are done for a reason wanting to influence policy and practice. Um, there's also limitations in existing work carried out, not about, by health researchers. Um, that health researchers are often highly knowledgeable about health, which you would hope, um, but much less aware of things like the difference between weather, climate, and climate change. Um, which matters um, because you can do, um, I, I, I make this criticism having suffered it from it myself because when I started my PhD, I had a, what in, in retrospect was a, a hugely naive plan to do a scoping review of the impacts of climate change on global child health. Um, so this was naive and dumb for a, bunch of reasons. Uh, one, because that scope was way too big, but also um, uh, I quickly ran into studies that were like, oh, we had more rainfall in such and such country and we noticed there was more malaria that year. Um, and I quickly bogged down in, the, in like, well, is that climate change? Because 
you know, we've always had problems with more rainfall in a year and an, an increased or decreased prevalence of such and such can health conditions. There's always been a relationship between weather and health. How do I distinct, distinguish that from the relationship of climate change and health? Um, and that is such a, uh, I came to realize that is such a central question. It's now part of my PhD research. Um, and I've set aside that, that ill-conceived scoping review. Um, so what is Cochrane's role in all of this? Um, and so I'll tell you a bit about um, one of two grassroots initiatives that are going on. So I want to acknowledge the, the work that the Cochrane Council has done. Um, I, I'm not, not part of the Cochrane Council, but um, what they have done is produced a document on, um, on calling on Cochrane, first of all, uh, calling on the governing board of Cochrane to look at ways to reduce Cochrane's uh, organizational carbon footprint, um, which is um, fantastic. And I know there's the discussions are still ongoing with the, with the board around that somewhat, I think, sidelined by the, by the pandemic, which makes sense. Um, but what I'm going to tell you a bit about is the development of the Climate Health Working Group, um, which I've been, been leading and which um, sprang up in a really amazing way in 2020. So where did this come from? So in the, I had been planning, um, as many of you I'm sure had planned to go to the 2019 colloquium, Cochrane Colloquium in Santiago. Um, and I had been tagged in a tweet about a meeting that was scheduled in Santiago to talk about environmental health reviews. So I'd gotten excited and I'd added it to my schedule. And then of course the colloquium was, was canceled. So the next year when we were planning for Toronto, I thought, Oh, let's, let, we should have that meeting again. So I contacted the people who had organized the one in Santiago and they said, sure, we'd be happy if you would, you would take this over. So I sent out a few emails to people around, should we have a meeting? And that was pretty informal, but my, um, my emails got forwarded to other people and then to other people. And next thing I knew, I had a bunch of people who wanted to talk about planning a meeting. Then those discussions jumped to let's plan a workshop for the Toronto Colloquium. So we worked super hard on what I think was a very good abstract um, for a workshop for the Toronto Colloquium. Unfortunately, the Toronto Colloquium was also cancelled um, or postponed to 2022, was not cancelled. It will still happen. Um, but in the meantime, we had just, we had generated so much enthusiasm and the group grew to an amazing size um, with people from many countries. Uh, the list is there. Um, and also many different parts of Cochrane. I don't think there's any type of group in Cochrane that isn't represented except for consumers at this point. Um, and then we also have people connected with other organizations. Um, so the two conveners of the Campbell Climate Solutions group that I mentioned that has just been set up have been part of our group and have been really helpful. Um, we also, through the group, have links with um, uh, people who have worked or do work at places like the World Health Organization or um, other public health agencies like that. So, so this group grew up very spontaneously. I have not done a really systematic or um, uh, extensive kind of recruitment process. And that's not because I don't, and that's partly sort of a balancing act of um, some points I'll talk about in a moment. Um, in that, um, basically before I work really hard on trying to expand the group, we need a bit more clarity about our scope, what's in and what's out, uh, and so on. Um, because our, our group is finding the, the scope of what we could be talking about really huge. Um, and also I, I, I mentioned that we don't have people identifying as consumers in the group, and that's no disrespect to consumers. Again, it's just represents the lack of, uh, the, the fact that to date we haven't, haven't really worked um, extensively for a, a broad-based recruitment. So we've had, I don't know, eight or 10 
maybe more teleconferences, Zoom calls for the group. And a whole bunch of sort of subtopics came up, many of which are, are interrelated. Um, so here's just a list of, of some of the topics we've, we've talked about. Um, and you'll see the interrelationships as we go. Um, so a discussion that we've, we've had, um, haven't come to a resolution yet, is as we move to thinking more long term and becoming less of a spontaneously generated ad hoc working group into something more long term, what are the boundaries on what we all talk about or consider as part of the scope? Um, pardon me. Um, so as I think, hopefully you took away from that kind of fire hose I gave you a few minutes ago around that huge range of climate health impacts. Um, there's, there's really a, a lot you can talk about when you talk about climate change and health and we can't take it all on. So do we, um, how do we decide what, what we would like to focus on and what we wouldn't like to focus on and create the rationale for that. Um, mapping climate relevant evidence syntheses. Um, so what I mean by that is um, some of you may be aware that um, in Archie, the document management system for Cochrane, you can go in um, to the record for a particular review and put what's called a tag on it. Um, when I worked with for the child health field, uh, we would tag um, reviews as being um, relevant to child health, for example, um, so that we, for a number of reasons, one of which we could count the number of reviews in the Cochrane Library that were relevant to child health, it also fed into the browse list on the Cochrane Library if people um, wanted uh, access to what had been identified as, as relevant to child health and so on. And so we thought a, a great early project would be tagging um, reviews, Cochrane reviews that were relevant to climate change. That became really complex too. Um, so that project is kind of on hold at the moment while we tangle with some, some more fundamental question. There's a bunch of methods issues um, around producing even Cochrane reviews or evidence syntheses in general. Um, we got excited about producing a manuscript to explain our work and invite others to join us. Um, unfortunately, the, the person who wanted to lead that manuscript got pulled into clinical service on, uh, related to the pandemic um, and hasn't been able to move that forward, but the enthusiasm is still there. Um, the discussions about scope um, relate a lot back to what I was talking about earlier around the the, the boundaries of what's in and what's out, um, but also relate a bit to if we if we want to become a, a long longer term Cochrane group, um, do we become a field? Do we become a methods group? Um, how do we? And then the expectations for those different types of entities would frame our scope, and so it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. We need to spend time on grant writing, grant writing and fundraising. Um, but we haven't had time to move to that yet. And then we also have a lot of enthusiasm around engaging with Cochrane more fully and the evidence synthesis community more fully. Um, so, yeah, so I talked a bit about this. I made this slide just um, to identify one, um, one of the issues we ran into. So there's, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but the taxonomy for tagging, I, I talked a bit about, we wanted to develop that. And then we ran into, there's no reviews in the Cochrane Library right now that are explicitly framed as, a, as climate relevant. Mm -hmm. And so then if we, if we are the ones creating the, the net, so to speak, on what we would pull in as climate relevant, uh, how do you, how broadly do you cast that? So for example, if there's a review on interventions for PTSD, um, but none of the included studies are on situations of natural disaster. Do we, is that relevant? Like we know PTSD comes up from being exposed to natural disasters that are related with climate change. Um, but if the review doesn't include studies on natural disasters, is it still relevant to climate change? Um, it's just a, a small issue, but probably of, of interest to some of you. So future directions and challenges for our group. Um, 
the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've listed it as a short-term preoccupation and I, I realize the pandemic is going to be taking up most of 2021, if not into 2022. I know the impacts will be felt for many years. Um, so when I say short-term, I don't mean that in a, in a naive or sense. Um, but over time, over the months to come, um, it will hopefully become less of a, of a driving preoccupation for many of the people in our group. So we have many clinician researchers in our group who are just flat at, working flat out at the moment, either doing COVID-related evidence syntheses or they're providing clinical care um, and they don't have time to think about anything else. And, um, and that's, I'm so grateful that there are people doing that work. Um, and so in, in time, they will have more, more brain space for the climate change stuff. We've also lost a bit of momentum. Um, so we were working really hard to be ready for the Toronto Colloquium. And then that got postponed. We, then we switched to working hard to have some, um, some events planned to coincide with, to take place at, I mean, the Global Evidence Summit in Prague, and now that's been postponed. And again, it's, it's, that's the way it has to be. Um, but having those very big deadlines removed has kind of, I think, dissipated our energy a little bit. We're also at a point where we need to think a lot about um, sustainability of our group. Um, we've, so we've, we're at kind of this stage in the group's evolution where we've moved from that initial burst of enthusiasm and people forwarding emails to other people inviting them to join um, and all the generation of those that fantastic list of ideas I showed you into kind of thinking well what comes next what do we like it do we just continue as a working group for a while and then disband or do we try to establish a longer term Cochrane entity um, and if we do that, then what do we become? Um, I would, my inclination would be that we would do really great work as a field, a climate health field. There's other people in the group who think that we should move more to becoming a methods group. Um, not, not consensus there. Either way, we, if we do want that, that longer term existence, we have to find, uh, a home base and leadership with an academic um, um, position. Um, so I can't do it. I'm not a professor. I don't have that kind of. Um, so I think I think every Cochrane group is led by somebody with an academic appointment. I can't offhand think of anyone who's not based at a university. And that that's what works well in terms of if you do have funding, you can hold the funding there or um maybe hive off other funding that you have to for seed projects or so on i don't have any of that i can't offer any of that um so we would we need to kind of think honestly about those issues um then funding of course um i mentioned we we haven't had the time to dive into grant writing yet um but it's hard um cochran is one of the most robust organizations I've ever seen in terms of long-term mobilization of volunteer effort. Um, but even so, if we could drum up a bit of funding to help pay for time or other resources um, to move some of this work forward, it, it would help a lot. So yeah, so we're kind of at that, that, that point of like, what, what, what now, what next? So here's my, here's, with all of that, all of that talking, um, I'm now at, now at the end. So here's a, a recap of what I've told you. Um, so climate change is already creating significant health impacts, as I've shown you. And we know that as climate change intensifies, which we know it will, um, those, climate, those health impacts will increase. Um, lots of other vulnerabilities mediate the health impacts from climate-related warming, climate-related extreme weather events. Um, it's, it's not a straight line. We need more research, a lot more research on evidence synthesis methods, looking at decision makers' needs, um, 
to work towards that goal I mentioned at the outset of having climate change being explicitly and appropriately considered in policies and programs. And the Co Co Cochrane Climate Health Working Group is working on a number of initiatives in this area. So with that, that's the end uh, of me, uh, or the end of my presentation anyway. Um, so I'll stop sharing. And if you have, um, by my clock, we have 20 minutes left. So hopefully you have questions or ideas or, or whatnot. Thank you so much, Denise. That was a great presentation. And um, so I would like to open the session now. We have uh, some experts in the call. And even if you're not an expert, please, uh, this is supposed to be an informal uh, panel discussion. And I would like to open for your questions. Also, feel free if you want to use the chat for your questions, I can read. Or also, we have our uh, webinars. Uh, coordinators who can help us in reading some of your questions. So without further ado, any questions to Denise? And Denise, this is Nina also. If you have any questions for the audience, uh, please feel free to, to ask. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess um, one one point I'd like to throw out to the group, because um, I, I see names I recognize in the, I just took a quick look at the participant list, um, is just based on your knowledge of Cochrane or so on, maybe ideas you have about, um, you know, our work going forward in terms of pulling in more people or establishing that more solid base or, or whatnot. I'm really that's a, a preoccupation of mine these days. So I'd, I'd love to hear people's ideas. So I will say, um, you know, what's going to be the first objective? What's the first goal? that uh, the climate health group wants to accomplish because you know this area is so large and comprehensive and there's so many aspects to it and uh, you know starting from one point one accomplishable goal i think it, it helps in terms of the growth and then you know the future development so as you who Share this group and is there in the rest of the evidence? What will you be the first path, the target of the uh, current climate health group? Um, it's a it, so it's a slightly tricky question to answer because, as I said, like so much of what we've talked about blends into um, to other. Um, to other issues. So trying to delineate the scope of our group, for example, brought up um, related really quickly to methods questions or to decision makers needs. Um, so for example, when we talked about um, in many of the conversations we've had around um, what the group should focus on, we come back to what do decision makers need out of evidence syntheses anyway. Um, and we were hoping to run a session on that at the Prague Global Evidence Summit, which we would have been a fantastic opportunity because that event was planned to bring together five organizations, not just Cochrane, but also Campbell and Jen and Joanna Briggs Institute. And I, I never remember all the all the groups, so I apologize to whoever I forgot. But um, so that would have been, I think, I think that is is a key area, and I. I noticed there's a question in the chat around asking, like, are evidence syntheses about the health impacts of climate change actually going to help anything? Um, and are, are policymakers actually ready to engage? Um, and I really believe that, and I'm so glad you asked, because this is going to be part of my PhD, um, 
but I really believe that um, that they are. And I think that a lot of the work that's being done on responding to climate change is happening at a sub, what I call a subnational level. Um, obviously, I know way more about Canada than I do about the US, but I think some of what I'm saying can extrapolate that. Um, um, like in looking at um, here, subnational would relate to say provinces or cities. A lot of what um, uh, cities do, for example, um, around things like making cities more walkable or running snow clearing pro projects in the winter or so on, um, that um, help help get people out of their cars and walking more or biking more, like bike lane uh, projects. All of that is is health related policy making because it makes people healthier. Um, but it's it's happening at that that much smaller scale than um, than you see at, at a national level. So so anyway, the short answer is yes. I do believe policymakers are interested. Um, it varies by jurisdiction. So for example, where I live is a highly highly conservative province where our leadership um, persists on tagging anyone who talks about climate change as um, foreign funded um, troublemakers. But our neighboring province, British Columbia, um, there's information right on their Ministry of Health website about climate change and the impacts that those will make and the steps that British Columbia is taking to address those. So it varies a great deal. Um, so what I want to do in my PhD is, um, is um, uh, do a sc one of the projects I want to do um, is do a scoping review on um, the factors that affect the development and implementation of climate health policy, and then also discuss those findings with a selection of policymakers to find out how they see climate change showing up in their in their job and what and what steps their organizations are doing about it. Um, so, and thank you. There's a, a response from John in the in the chat about. I guess there's just those four partners for the Prague Global Evidence Summit, which has been rescheduled. And Denise, did you see there was a follow up question from Susan? Kate, thank you for your question. Um, but then Susan said, You're answering my question. Yeah. <laughs> it was a similar question about policymakers who are they? How do we find them and ask what they want? Yeah. Yeah. And so the, um, so part of that is, is my, going to be my PhD work. And then also, as I mentioned, um, one of the neat things about the Climate Health Working Group is it's brought in folks with connections, for example, to the World Health Organization or the Public Health Agency of Canada or so on. Um, and so that that has given us the potential for connections and conversations. So not just for my PhD, but for the working group with those folks who can, can really help us in terms of guiding what, what they need. Um, and so one thing that policymakers do um, where they do draw on evidence is a whole field of research or work called vulnerab vulnerability and adaptation assessments. Um, so those are um, projects that often done in a city or um, at a provincial state level around just exactly what you would say. Um, uh, mapping climate related vulnerabilities in that location and, and trying to develop plans to deal with them. Often, um, and uh, another really important point is that health ministries don't work alone in these responses. So if you're, um, like we have, where I live, a lot of issues with wildfires, um, very terrible wildfires where people are evacuated and the effects last for years. Um, and so obviously a, a coordinated response to those involves your health ministry, but also many other ministries as well. And so um, it, it'll be important to sort of dig a bit on, on that cross ministry work and how syntheses, how to frame syntheses that are seen as relevant for that. Um, Cause it's not, it's not just a matter of, you know, do we approve this drug or not, or do we administer it or not to it or which much more, um, focused questions that we're often answering in health.
We're at 1249 by my laptop. So uh, if you have more questions or, or comments, keep them coming. And again, Denise, I didn't, if you wanted to ask a question of the audience, I'd invite you to do that as well. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've much beyond, beyond what I asked. Um, but um, uh, certainly people can always follow up with me. I know I've kind of done the, the fire hose approach of, of um, sharing a lot of, of information. So um, you can always send me an email afterwards uh, and to follow up or, or to find out more. So my email address is dthompson, so D-T-H-O-M-S-O-N. Um, that's Thompson without a P, uh, which is a less common spelling, at ualberta.ca. So that's U-A-L-B-E-R-T-A dot C-A. Um, and uh, I'm happy happy to answer questions at all because it all the questions I get help me help me think things through. So, Denise, I put your email in the chat. Can you confirm oh. that I heard you? I believe I got it all. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's that's accurate. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I will also try to include the climate health group uh, website in case if anyone want to visit. Yeah, yeah, we have um, the Co Cochrane Complementary Medicine field kindly freed up a page on their website for us. So there's a bit of background there about what we're doing. Um, Denise, we have a question in the chat about uh, making your slides available. Um, we will have uh, the recording available. Um, I, I dropped the link to uh, the, the recording at the top of the chat. I can, I can repeat it again. Um, would you be interested, Denise, in posting your slides at, at, on that same web page? Um, I think obviously guess the I, content of them will be in the recording, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd have... Um, I just let me think about that. I don't see any reason sure. why not, but I should sure. probably just just think about it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and you can follow up with me after. Sure. Okay, so we have the um, climate health working group uh, site. Uh, Mary um, added that for us. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, well, uh, I want to say again, Denise, thank you so much for making the time. I know nowadays time is the most precious uh, thing we can ask, and uh, it's always uh, so important uh, to talk about climate health and uh, learn more about it. So I really appreciate the work you are doing and uh, your group, and being a member is uh, very uh, insightful for me. So thank Great. you very much for everything. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation today. Uh, it was really helpful for me. I liked, I enjoyed speaking with you and the, and the, the work of putting together the presentation was, uh, was very helpful for my thinking. So, great. All right. Bye, thank you, thank you everyone. Okay, goodbye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, goodbye.